everything you put on social media, everything is being looked at. And when people are looking at that, they're going to be making an assessment. Do I know what this person does? Do I know what this person stands for? What are their values? And are they aligned with my values? We're not saying we have to do business with people who believe the same as we do. But is there a level of consistency? Because now more than ever, is that people are doing their research on you. You're listening to the Thought Leaders Business Lab, the podcast for coaches, thought leaders, and change makers who are ready to become the standout expert. If that's you, stay tuned because you're in the right place. I'm your host, Samantha Riley, and I want to help you build a successful business sharing your expertise, generate the impact and income you need to create your ideal lifestyle. It's time to make a difference and scale up. Are you ready? Let's enter the lab. Welcome to the Thought Leaders Business Lab, Darren. It's great to have you joining me today. Hey, Samantha. Great to have you interviewing me and being on your podcast. Really appreciate it. It's good. We've been friends for, actually, I was just thinking before we recorded, almost 10 years now. I reckon it is 10 years because the last time we were face-to-face was in a room down in Melbourne and we were learning to fine-tune, if you like, our facilitation skills. We were. And I remember we were talking a lot about Raisin Toast. We were talking a lot about Raisin Toast. And do you know, I feel really bad because I can't even remember what you were talking about. I remember that we had to put together some crazy like rock band thing. (laughs) Yeah. And yeah. But before that, you made a massive impression on me because the little presentation that you were doing was on Raisin Toast (laughs) and why we should have Raisin Toast. (laughs) (laughs) I was fine tuning those presentation skills like never. Never used them again. Never talked about raisin toast again in my life. But do you know what the funny thing about that is? Isn't it funny though, the things you remember about people because that has left an indelible mark on me. So every time I see you on social, every time I listen to your podcast, every time we kind of talk, I can't help but raise that in terms of raisin toast because whilst you may not eat raisin toast anymore, it's certainly it's something that I always remember because it was the way you actually presented that stuck with me. Wow. And we had other people in the program. And I remember the rock band we put together and I couldn't tell you the other members of that band. Wow. It's all a blur other than Samantha Riley. (laughs) Actually, I've just remembered you talked about chicken and egg fried rice. That's it. (laughs) And again, that is the only one I can think of. So there you go. What we've just proved before we've started this amazing conversation and we are going to dive into sales is that you and I like to eat. Oh, we do. Yeah. (laughs) And it's fuel that enables us to do the things we do. (laughs) That is such a good point that we never know the impression that we're leaving on someone and how that can go for decades and decades and decades. And I think that that's a perfect segue into what we're going to talk about today, which is sales, because people are behind sales, you know, relationships are behind sales. And it's such an important part of being able to make sales and to, you know, keep our business afloat, essentially. 100%. Could not agree more. And one of the things that I've been doing this for a number of years now, like since 2015 full time. And one of the things that I'm always working on for myself, but also with clients that I work with is how do we create that impression with somebody that is almost like what I call an impression of increase where they feel better for having had a conversation or or an interaction with you. And it's not about us pushing a product onto them or getting them to do something they don't want to do. It's simply how do I make them feel good to the point they remember me? And so when they're in that buying cycle and I might have a product or a service that might fit into that buying cycle, I'm the first person they think about. And it's just those little things because we've got multiple opportunities every single day where we can do this. And it comes down to what your philosophy is and and are you trying to add value to people or are you trying to get something from people? And I love that. This episode is made possible by your podcast concierge. Editing your podcast can be time consuming. Your podcast concierge offers comprehensive and affordable podcast production and social media marketing services to help you grow your podcast and business faster. Go to yourpodcastconcierge.com and book a call via the Let's Talk button on the homepage and receive 50% off your first month when you mention Thought Leaders Business Lab. Why don't you start off by giving us your take on what sales really are? Because it's not just a transaction of, I've got this thing and I want you to give me money in return. 
It's a really good question. At a really basic level, I look at sales as being service. It is literally the ultimate form of service. Now, this is not about flogging your product, although if you go to sales training, if you work in some organizations, they'll have you believe that we have the best product or the best service in the marketplace. We are number one at this and we are number one at that. (laughs) Sell me this pen. (laughs) Correct. And quite frankly, your customer doesn't care. What they care about is do you care about them? Because they want to do business with people, and this is the cliche I know, but they want to do business with people who they know, who they like, and who they Mm -hmm. trust. And so the first fundamental thing from a salesperson's point of view, now whether you are in an organization or whether you are a coach consultant, an individual who's running their own business, it's the ultimate form of service that if you can give somebody something of value and you can leave them with an impression of increase where they leave that interaction, and it doesn't have to be a sale on the first conversation because we might delve into the number of interactions you might have to have before people feel confident buying from you. It's about leaving them with that impression of increase. So it's how can I be of service? So my philosophy is sales literally is the ultimate form of service that if you can identify where a problem might exist, and sometimes the people don't know that they have a problem, but through an interaction with you, they recognize, my God, I didn't realize that I had that situation or I've got that problem. Do you have a solution for that? Well, I might have a solution, but let's just explore that. And it's not about pushy stuff. It's about if there is a a possible solution and if there's a definite problem this person understands that they might have, then doesn't it make sense that I'll just share that solution, whether they end up taking it or not? But it's the ultimate form of service. So a lot of it then comes down to an attitude. So many, many people in this, and Australians are pretty good, and I'm sure people around the world are really good as well. The BS meter is, is pretty, pretty up and about. And people can detect when there's a level of neediness or a level of desperation that this person needs to sell this thing in order to make a certain target or they need cash flow. As a salesperson, we need to actually work on our own mindset to remove the attachment to that outcome to the point where it's 100% about that particular person. So if this person does have a problem, then yeah, I've got a solution, but I'm not going to push that solution onto them because if they don't want that solution, then I'm not going to provide it to them. But if they need it, I'm going to do them a service and give them the opportunity to go forward with that. You talked about just then about sort of, I want to think of this on a scale, like if 10 is the salesperson super needy and I'm trying to sell this product, I almost feel like, and I could be wrong, but I feel like this happens more in Australia than in other parts of the world. But if 10 is pushy, I feel like, one is a lot of people that don't understand the difference between selling and purely just, and I'm going to put this in air quotes, adding value, that are almost afraid to ask for the sale. Do you see this a lot? Absolutely. Absolutely. And to use the scale methodology or the analogy is a really good one because on the one end of the scale at a 10, you've got the super salesperson who's been to all these different sales schools and it's like closing at every single opportunity because their thought process is, I've got a live customer in front of me, either physically or on the phone or via Zoom. And because of that, I've got to close them at every opportunity, right? So I'm going to look for every little nook and cranny, every little angle, and we've just got to close it, whether they like it or not. That's what creates for many people a really sour taste because it's not the ultimate form of service. On the other end of the scale, you're absolutely right. You've got people who I'm going to be here to add value. And when I say don't connect yourself with the outcome, that's a mindset, but you still have to have the courage to ask the question. And sometimes people need to be led because they want to be led about what the next step is. So if we're not asking the question, so Sam, based on everything we've talked about today, what would you like to do next? Or what do you think the next best step is? Or based on everything we've talked about today, This is what I suggest we do next and leading them through a process because they want to be led by somebody as long as we have built credibility and we are seen as an authority in what we're actually doing. They want to be led, right? And they expect that. So to end, uh, and I'd be almost saying that on the other end of the spectrum where people are just there to add value, hoping that the person through osmosis will just say, hey, can I buy your Uh stuff? I mean, that's a little bit delusional as well because you do have to ask the question, because a lot of people are going to be afraid to ask you the question, hey, can I buy your stuff? Yes, yes, because they're backing themselves into a corner. And I feel like that a lot of people have taken this attract prospects out of context and they think that attract prospects mean that people will just come to them and ask for the sale, where that's not what it is at all. 
exactly like you're saying, you need to lead them. This is the process. This is what I've got. Let's enter into a conversation. And I think that there's just a a lot of misunderstanding in the market of how sales work. 100%. Classic example, I'm working with a client right now who has built a reasonably sized business. She's in the creative industry, a creative marketing industry. And she's a self-confessed hater of sales. I don't want to do sales. I never want to do sales. I hate sales. I don't, it's all icky for me. But I said to her, well, the interesting thing is when people do business with you and your organization, they want to do business with you, right? So to remove yourself from the sales process is a challenge because ultimately they want to deal with you and talk with you and be led by you. So whether we like it or not, we have to get involved in sales, but it's It's the approach to sales that we need to really think about. It's not about pushing a product onto a person who doesn't want it or doesn't need it. It is about leading them and giving them a feeling of comfort that I'm with the right person. I have the right relationship. I trust this person to lead me and guide me into the direction that I want to go. Because often, if you think about a sales process, often people are asked to do something that is unfamiliar for them because the very nature of the product or the service that they're going to be purchasing is designed to create a transformation or some form of change. So to take them from an area of comfort into an area of discomfort, for many people to make that leap is really foreign to them. And as a natural human tendency, what are we going to try to do in most cases? Well, I want to try and bust my butt, excuse the French, to actually stay in my comfort zone because I'm, I I'm not sure what the new world's going to look like. So if you think about the, like the hero's journey, it's going into the unknown world and I'm going to have to face some things that perhaps... I don't want to face yet. And hence they put up the barriers. Totally. Love the way you explain that. Value. You're talking about adding value. Sales is adding value. Can you give us a description or, you know, like your perception of what that adding value is? Again, as we were talking about before, the people that sort of just talking, but don't actually ask for the sales. So is adding value something that comes before the process starts? Where does it fit from your perspective? Well, First of all, the value description or the value definition, it's not what I think is valuable. So I might think what I have to share is valuable, but it only becomes valuable when the person I'm sharing it with says, mate, that's new. I didn't realize that. Or that's a different perspective. Thank you. That's value. So it's value in the eyes of the beholder, to use the well-worn cliche. And so it needs to be understood by the person you're having this conversation with as to what is value. And it doesn't have to be. And this is where a lot of people make the mistake, particularly when it comes to sales. And we've seen this in the coaching industry as well, that a lot of people think, well, I've got to almost take this person from zero to hero. And there's this massive gap that sits between those two benchmarks. And my job as a coach or my job as a salesperson is to bridge that gap. Well, no, it's not. Your job as a salesperson is to give person A or person person B potentially the first step. What is the first step? Now, if that first step takes that person out of the area of comfort into an area of slight discomfort, but they can see they're making progress, then guess what? When it comes to defining value, that's valuable for them because they see they're making progress. If you're there to support them, right, and you're not running away, you're not just asking, putting your hand out for more money to take them to the next step, then they say, well, I can trust this person because they are with me the first step. They're with me for the second step. So this is valuable. So different people will have different interpretations or definitions of what value is. But we have to remember as a salesperson, as a coach, as a consultant, that the value is going to be defined by what the person we're having the conversation with, how they define value. Because what I think is valuable, somebody else might think, you know what? Nah, blah, that's not valuable to me. I need something different. I need something better. I need something bigger. I've seen this a lot. I haven't seen it as much lately, but, you know, when the lifestyle entrepreneurs started, you know, coming out onto the internet and they were like, everyone, you know, you need a a life where you're lying on a beach and drinking cocktails every day. And that the whole industry did themselves a disservice because they were sort of saying, you know, this is the life and not realizing that that's not the life for everyone, you know, and that's why I often talk about if you want to be a stay-at-home mom and just work between, you know, 10 and 2, then that's your dream. That's fine. You don't have to follow other people's dreams. And I think that, yeah, like I said, a lot of disservice is happening when you don't understand that everyone's value is different. Totally. And I love the analogy there. And, and you still see it to some degree today, people sitting on the beach, they've got their laptop open. I'm not sure where the cause is. Maybe it's, they've only got two hours <laughs> worth of 
or maybe it's just a screen in the background, but yeah, push this button and everything will be rosy. And it's just, it's just not. And look, the thing with sales is it's hard work, right? And it's not for everybody. But here's the thing. Every single person's in sales. Every single person. And at some point, I mean, both you and I are married, not to each other, but we're married. And, and at some point, <laughs> you know, one of us got sold at some point. Right. right? Now, whether you're selling an idea, whether you're selling a product, whether you're selling a concept, whether you're selling yourself in an interview or into a prospective customer, every single person is selling. And one of the things that I do now, and whether it be running workshops for coaches, consultants, or small businesses or big corporates, it's to try to get that message across that you don't have to be in a sales role to be considered to be a salesperson because every single person is. And I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago with a person who was almost the antichrist when it came to sales and had this fixation on what sales was. And unfortunately, experiences had left a really sour taste in her mouth. And so I spent probably a good two hours with her trying to help her understand that a lot of the myths and the misconceptions and the predisposition around what she thought was sales was completely false. And that what she was actually doing and continuing to do was adding value. Guess what? providing value to our key stakeholders and inviting them to take some form of action, whether that be stepping forward and agreeing to her in terms of her philosophy or her course of action or taking on some form of product or new idea, it's selling. And the more people can understand that, the better sales will be and the better name sales across, I guess, the entire industry will become. Because it's not about just pushing stuff. Totally. So there's probably people that are listening right now that go, you know what, Darren, I absolutely get what you're saying. I've heard it before from a logical level. I get that. But I'm like the person that you were speaking with before. I've got a sour taste in my mouth. I don't like asking people for the sale because I've been in horrible situations like that before. So what would you share with those people to help them understand that sales are just helping people? So, you know, we logically understand it, but what needs to happen? The first thing that needs to happen is as a person, as an individual, I have to ask myself, what is my intention here? When I'm in front of somebody, what is my intention? Is my intention to get something from this person? Or is this, is my intention to transfer something to this person, right? And it starts with intention. I often say that the sales process doesn't actually start until after the sale is made. And just think about the number of interactions you've had in your career with people who, for all intents and purposes, have sold, sold you something. It could be a car, it could be a house, it could be anything, right? And leading up to that transaction, they've been all over you. They've been building the relationship, they've been adding value, and they've been you know, asking you great questions and appearing interested in you. And then as soon as the transaction happens, it's like crickets. They're like, where the hell have I gone? They've taken my money, and now I can't get in contact with them. They're not coming back to me. They're not talking to me. They're not touching base with me. That's the worst possible thing you can do. Now, even if you're in a transactional sale is environment, and I know from a coaching consulting perspective, we'd like to have longer term relationships. If we're providing value, then we know that once you and I do a transaction, that's when the sale starts. Because guess what? Once you buy a product, once you buy a service, you're going to be asking the question of yourself, have I made the right decision? This has cost me a bucket load of money, I better be getting the value that I think I'm going to get based on what the perception was that was created by the person who sold me this idea, right? So if I've got somebody who is now selling me a product or selling me a service, and they are all over me even more, building a better relationship, looking for other ways to add value and being there to help me through the steps to take me from the old world into the new world, then guess what? I now feel more comfortable having made that decision And then all of a sudden, the taste that I have in my mouth around sales that might have been there before now starts to turn into a more flavorsome taste because now I see, hmm, this person hasn't left me. They've got my money, but they're now looking at how they can add even further value. So from an intention point of view, what is my intention as a salesperson? Is it to, what is it called, a catch and grab and just go off to the next customer? Or is it to look for what is the life cycle of this particular customer? And if I'm in a transactional sales type of environment, who does Samantha know that she might be able to refer to me for an opportunity to also get some sort of service? But Sam's only going to do that if I actually continue to add value and she feels comfortable recommending me to somebody else. Because when you think about it, it's therefore going to be a transfer of trust that you transfer to somebody else. Because if I then don't provide them a great level of service, 
then they're going to come back to you and say, Sam, why did you give me Darren's number for? Because he was such a dodgy character. Why would you do that? And so your level of trust you have with those people starts to reduce. And so from a selling perspective, we've got to always start with what is my intention here? Is my intention to do a one transaction or is my intention to build a relationship over a long period of time and who knows where it's going to end up, right? I'm here for the long haul. So I still have clients that I've worked with like four or five years ago that don't pay me anymore. But guess what? I'm still there and I'm still in contact with them and I'm still helping them when I need to. It's about adding value, right? Because I know when the opportunity presents itself again and it's happened, they'll refer somebody to me or they'll come back and want to do something at a higher level and that's all good. When they're ready, I'm ready. I love that you've just said that. And I want to jump in because the sale doesn't always happen or you don't always get the sale from the person standing in front of you. And this is what some people don't understand. And this is a big something that I talk about a lot. And especially in the social media world, there's a lot of people that say, you know, clear your social media. If they're not an ideal client, get rid of them. But you never, ever, ever know where that sale is going to come from. There are people in my world that refer, refer, refer. And guess what? Some of those people have never even bought from me but they refer a huge amount of sales to me. So it's not always about, you know, each person being a wallet, right? But that's... <laughs> that's ex- Everyone's got dollar signs on top of their head. <laughs> Everyone's walking around with a dollar sign on their head. I love that we both, like, no one can see us because we're on video, but put the big L up on our hand. We're both sitting here like losers. <laughs> but, you know, like the neon dollar sign and they're not really looking at it. The other thing I wanted to mention, and I wanted to go back to, you know, the sales starts at a different process to what a lot of people do. My husband and I had some really, uh, really interesting couple of instances. We both decided to work with a new mentor. We both decided on Friday who that mentor was. He flicked a message off to the person he wanted to work with. I flicked off a message to the person I wanted to work with. I didn't hear from the person for two days. When I did, I got one sentence back in an email. Here's the link. The link went to a price that was completely different to what I'd been quoted. I went, oh, let me just clarify that. And then it was like a few backwards and forwards and it was, I felt kind of weird and it felt uncomfortable. And then I did sign up and then I didn't hear from them for another day. And I have no idea what's happening. It's very, very weird. Someone who uh, my husband sent a message to, the phone got picked up. He called him. He are exactly what you were saying. What is it that you're trying to do? You know, let's like, where are you trying to get to? You know, do, can I fill that gap even? But not, here's the link for my thing. Can I actually fill that gap? What is it that you want after I fill this gap? And I thought that was such a clever question. So straight away, he's already seeded. Oh, cool. So when you get this outcome, you're going to work with me for the next thing, which guess what? He will, because he's had such a great experience. 100%. He's already working with that person within 12 hours. I'm still like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Super interesting, right? <laughs> different different experiences and different perceptions you therefore have on, I'm not sure whether it's mentoring in the same area, but different perceptions on mentoring, right, in terms of the experience you're getting. Your husband's going to be thinking, well, this is fantastic because this person, guess what, is adding value and we probably haven't even started working together yeah. yet. And if I'm getting value at this level, just imagine when we do start working together, how much more value I'm going to get. And and you're sitting there thinking, hmm, (laughs) hello, is anybody home? (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's that moment where you're like, okay, I've just put my credit card in. (laughs) Have I just paid a Nigerian prince? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Have I just been duped here? (laughs) uh, But it's interesting. And this is the thing for sales people we need to really be conscious of is what is the impression? What is the perception? What is the, yeah, the impression we're trying to create in the marketplace, right? Because you're right. And this, particularly when you're talking about social media and coaches and consultants need to be really focused on this is everything you put on social media, everything is being looked at. And when people are looking at that, they're going to be making an assessment. Do I know what this person does? Do I know what this person stands for? What are their values? And are they aligned with my values? Do we believe in certain things? Now, we're not saying we have to do business with people who believe the same as we do. That's not what I'm saying at all. But is there a level of consistency? Because now more than ever, and this is why it's so important from a selling perspective, is that people are doing their research on you. So often, and I talk a lot about this in the corporate space, even before people decide 
who they're going to be choosing in terms of a vendor or, or a salesperson or a consultant, they already know before they've spoken to them what their decision is. Then the conversation simply becomes confirmation of what their original decision was because they've done so much research. And so from a selling perspective, we've got to be really conscious of what impression, what perception, what branding we're trying to create to the marketplace because that is credibility. If you're out there in the marketplace giving mixed messages, then it actually will confuse the buyer and a confused mind will not buy. Selling is all about providing clarity to enable that person to make a decision that's going to be in the best interest of them in the short term, but also hopefully in the best interest for them in the longer term. And in order for them to make a decision, they need to have a sense of clarity that there's a match between what you can offer them and what they're looking for in terms of value. The world has definitely changed. But, you know, back in the early 90s when I started my business, people would reach out to us because we hadn't had in the Yellow Pages. You know, if you decided that you wanted to buy something, you'd go through the Yellow Pages, you'd circle three businesses, you'd give them a call, and then the research would start after you'd spoken with them. Now, totally, they've done the research beforehand and they're already coming to the call going, well, let's see if I like you or not because I'll either hand my credit card over or I won't. Correct. How much of that value that you're putting up front needs to be, and this could be a little, I don't know if you're going to get where I'm going here, polarization, like knowing who that ideal client is and adding the value, but also not, I guess, not standing for something or trying to please everyone. Does that in itself have a confusing message to the marketplace? This is only my opinion. And so let's just take that with, this is my opinion. I would say no, because my view on sale, first of all, there's enough clients there for everybody. If you have this perception and belief that there's an abundance out there, then there is. there's clients left, right, and center just waiting for you to actually provide value to them. But what it means, therefore, is you have to be really clear on, yes, what your ideal client and who your ideal client is, but also who your ideal client is not. I've had many experiences where I've taken on a client that perhaps at the time I thought was a good fit or I thought I could add value or here's a good coaching phrase that we shouldn't have learned in coaching school. I think I can change them. <laughs> <laughs> so I took them on, right? And I knew that from the first interaction that this wasn't a good fit. So it became a painful experience for both of us. And so we have to be really clear on, on my service, my product, my idea is not going to be for everybody. So I don't have to be all things to all people and I don't have to be the best thing in the whole world. What I have to be the best at is providing a service to help that person in their world, right? Now, if that means there's a very, very narrow niche and a very, very narrow and deep niche where you become an absolute expert in what you do, then so be it, which means there's going to be a lot of people outside of that that won't qualify for your service and that's perfectly okay. So don't try to be all things to all people. And this is where a lot of people fall short is they're too general. And we see this a lot in coaching. I'm an executive coach or I'm a leadership coach. Well, with respect, whoopie doo da, who do you actually coach, right? What's the specific problem that you work on and how can you be unique in solving that particular problem? And so, and there's so many cliches you can use. And the biggest one is you go to a GP, they'll give you a certain level of medical advice. You go to a cardiologist, they'll give you specialist advice. And if you look at what they charge, it's a massive difference between what a cardiologist charges and what a general GP charges. And so the thing we have to understand is we're not going to be all things to all people. So don't get fixated on, oh, there's, there's just a certain number of clients out there. And, and if Sam's got this client, it means that I can't get that client. And therefore, there's not many clients. I'm, I might have to go and do something else. No, get very clear on what the problem is because there are people out there right now who are waiting for you to be in their world to solve that problem. The question is, how do we get access to them and how do we make them aware that we exist, that the message is sound, we provide them a level of clarity to the point where we then incent them to have a conversation with us to then do a transaction. That's the art of it, right? And so when you're putting things out on social media, you've got to be really conscious of what are the messaging that I'm sending out? Am I talking to the person who would resonate with that message? But also understand I'll be talking to people who won't resonate that with that message and that's perfectly okay. And so whether it be things like a podcast, right? So I do a podcast as well, and it's very, very specific to sales and sales leadership. And so I'm not going to be dealing with doctors. I'm not going to be dealing with farmers, right? Unless they're in the sales game and they need to sell stuff, but very, very specific, which means I will attract a certain audience and I'm perfectly okay with that because there's enough to go And around. that also puts you in the expert or the specialist, 
you know, or even as I like to talk, you know, moving up into that thought leadership position where you're not being compared with other people, not just compared on what you do, but compared on price more importantly. Oh, that's the biggest thing. And it's a great, probably we could talk about another two days on price. <laughs> Most salespeople in terms of differentiation, they think, well, what have I got to differentiate? I think I've got the best product or best service. And I say, oh, I think you're a bit expensive. Oh, okay. What if I give you a 10, 15% discount? How would that sound? And so many people get into a price war and it's something that we need to be really conscious of. You need to know what your value is and you need to stand by that value and do not discount. So talking about that price when, you know, that is a sales objection that comes up, you know, oh, that's expensive. How would you normally suggest that someone deals with that objection? Well, first of all, with objections, it's a sign that the person actually has a level of interest because if they didn't put that out there, would they be interested in potentially doing some business or at least exploring doing some business? So when people say things, I think that's really expensive or I'd like to think about it, it really is a sign that there is a level of care there. There is a level of interest there. They just haven't got enough information from which to then make an educated decision about what's best for them. So they're still stuck in the old world. One of the first things, and I'm not going to give you, you know, exactly what words to say because it'll be different for different people, but essentially what the person's saying is, this is too expensive. My first thought process is interesting. Let me ask you a question. What are you comparing it to? Right? How do you know? When you say expensive, help me understand what expensive means. Because when people are going into an area, and just take the mentoring, for example, you, know, you had a link, you went, oh, that's a different price that I was quoted. So there's this benchmark you might have in your mind as to what something is valued at, right? But if you have nothing to compare it to, then how can you say that that's expensive, right? So you need to have something. So we always do a comparison game. And so we need to understand when somebody says this is expensive, what are they comparing it to? Are they comparing it to an experience they had five years ago? Are they comparing it to something that's in their head? Or are they comparing it to something that's very specific, that's very tangible, that we can then have a conversation? Because the word expensive doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to do business. They just need some more information to make them feel more comfortable about jumping out of their comfort zone into an area of unfamiliarity, which then comes back again to the fact that, you know what, that's when the sale really starts. Because if the person is comfortable moving forward, they're going to be there for a test of us as to what we're going to do next. Are we still going to be there for them? Are we going to continue to hold their hand and lead them into the next phase? And so how we make them feel more comfortable in that transaction. Because for many people, when it comes to coaching and mentoring, it's a big investment for a lot of people. And it's not something that they have ordinarily put funds to. But here's the thing. They won't question going out and buying a massive TV. They won't question going out and buying a car on a high lease or a high purchase. And they won't even question spending 50, 60, 100 grand on a car. And yet when it comes to spending even a tenth of that on their own professional development, which by the way, will enable them to earn a lot more than a hundred grand in their own career, they think, wow, this is really expensive because they've never had a frame of reference for it. And that's the big thing. What is the frame of reference? What are you comparing this to? It's simply ignorance. And I say that respectfully because they don't know what expensive is. They can't tangibly put a meaning to it. And therefore, what do they say? Well, this is expensive. Hmm, interesting. Now, if we accept that, and then, and this is what a lot of inexperienced salespeople do, is they'll say, well, Sam, I appreciate that. What if I gave you a 10% discount? Or we've got this early bird offer. What if I give you it at 50% off? How would that sound? Cool. Now, who's doing the buying? Now, it's flipped. It's flipped. And what are you now teaching your client to do, particularly if you're going to be coaching and mentoring them on helping them do exactly the same thing with their clients? You're now conditioning them to think, well, at the first sign of some objection, particularly around price, they're going to think, oh, well, what Darren did for me is he discounted. So what am I going to do? I'm going to discount, which means you're going to be leaving bucket loads of money on the table instead of sitting back and saying, hang on a second, before we go any further, help me understand. When you say it's expensive, can you give me some context? And let's just have a conversation. You don't have to close the deal. You don't have to overcome the objection because there's no objection that has to be overcome. We simply have to handle it. And all the handling it is, is understanding their perspective so that we can lead them to a decision that they feel comfortable about, which then means they have a good taste in their mouth. Absolute gold. It's such a mindset shift that is so simple, 
that completely circles back to the what's the intention. The intention is that we want to create an amazing experience for these people, add value, and either help them if we can or point them in the right direction if we can't. Totally. And that's the thing. If we can work together, then great. Love to work with you. But if that we're not a fit, that's perfectly okay. I'm not going to take you off social media. I'm not. <laughs> I'll introduce you to other people. And because if I continue to give, and this is the key point, is if I continue to give and give with no expectation of anything directly in return, it doesn't become a transaction. It becomes an investment. And I know that the more I invest, the more I'm going to get a return at some point. And often, as you said, you get referrals from people who perhaps they don't do necessarily business with you, but they actually refer other people. So you get compensated for that and you get rewarded for that. Why? Because you continue to add value to the person who hasn't done a transaction with you, but you're still there adding value anyway. And that's the game. Love it so much. So definitely take a listen to Darren's podcast, the Exceptional Sales Leader Podcast, because if you have realized how much value has been dropped here today, you'll want to definitely head over to that podcast and hear value bombs dropped every single episode. But Darren, how else can we stay connected with you? The best way is my business card is LinkedIn. So my marketplace pretty much sits on LinkedIn. So jump on LinkedIn, either search for sales leadership coach, and it'll come up with me, my big buffet on the screen. <laughs> Or type in Darren Mitchell and, and you'll find me there. So that's the best way to And of course, me. we'll link that up as always in the show notes over at samanthariley.global forward slash podcast. Darren, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. I can't believe we talked about so much, including raisin bread and fried rice and still covered off the sales. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. We did. Sam, thanks for inviting me. It's been great catching up again. Really appreciate it. It's been great to share another episode of the Thought Leaders Business Lab podcast with you. If you want more, head over to samanthariley.global forward slash podcast for the show notes, the links from today's sponsors, and to download your detailed episode companion for the extensive notes and value bombs we shared today. And if you're looking to connect with other experts and change makers just like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive Thought Leaders Business Lab community on Facebook. The links are waiting for you over at samanthariley.global forward slash podcast.